Two pilots on the same wing can have totally different experiences because weight range doesn't tell the full story. But there's a new way to decide which glider to fly. You may have been told to fly at 50 to 75% of your glider's range, but in some cases, this is bad advice. Today, I'm gonna to show you how flying in the middle could be holding you back by using a wing loading calculator that I've made for you. So if you wanna know, instead of guess, you can get the tool for free at the end of this video. But first, we need to understand where this old advice comes from. Certification measures how our wings respond to deflations with so-called passive safety. It tells us how the wing recovers in calm, controlled testing, but nothing about how it handles, how it feels in turbulence, or how it penetrates into wind. Two physical factors generally drive this certification. Aspect ratio determines the wing's complexity. Low aspect ratio wings are chunky. The tips are close to the pilot, making the glider more of a cohesive structural unit. High aspect ratio wings have tips far from the center, making them more snaky due to less structural support. When they do collapse, the behavior is generally more complex. Wing loading determines the internal pressure and the energy of the wing. High aspect ratio wings are generally designed to be flown at higher wing loadings. This isn't just for speed, it's because of the physics. Higher loading increases dynamic pressure and helps the wing stay more pressurized and cohesive. A solid wing under high loading tends to be more resistant to collapses, but it can significantly increase the energy and the violence of the reaction if it does collapse. In contrast, lower energy wings tend to react slower and recover more gently, but they are inherently less collapse resistant due to that lower internal pressure. So what does this mean for you? If you have ever felt your wing is a bit mushy in the handling, or you feel pushed around, or maybe you have less pitch stability and struggle to get into strong thermals, that is exactly what we're talking about here. The trade-off between gentle recovery and authority over your wing. But there's also a hidden problem. We fly entirely by feel. Your ability to interpret and use the tension in the brake lines and the pressure in your harness is the root of paragliding skill. It is how you find the core and how you sense and respond to a collapse before it happens. This process is called implicit learning. It is the ability to develop skill, not through conscious thinking, but through direct experience. Like when you learn to walk or ride a bike. Your nervous system builds patterns automatically but only if the feedback signal is crystal clear. Skill is just your nervous system reading the wing's language. A loaded wing speaks clearly. A lightly loaded wing whispers. When we fly cross country, we fly in active turbulent air. By aiming for the safe middle, you may be dulling that signal. You're trading active authority for so-called passive safety. Instead of flying the glider, the glider starts to fly you. You become a passenger instead of an active pilot. This feeds into what I call the floaty myth. Pilots are often terrified of being heavy. They blame their sinking out on this. They aren't technically wrong. Research from gliding birds to spacecraft design confirms that lower wing loading does improve your minimum sink rate. If your goal is to float in very light, dead calm, glassy air, then flying light is scientifically superior. But in the real world, the difference is often negligible. After putting on a little bit of size recently, I find myself flying my Skywalk Mint a few kilograms over the top of the weight range. Technically, this is not ideal and I'm not advocating for this, but I mention this to prove a point. I have no issues maintaining altitude even in light lift. Excuses don't allow growth. Progress begins when we stop blaming our equipment and start improving our skill. To counter this, it helps to replace one word, failure with learning. And cross country rarely happens in dead calm air. It happens in wind and rowdy thermals. In the real world, a floaty wing is often inefficient because it gets pushed out of lift and pinned in headwinds. Even in non-cross country conditions, you can be caught out flying light if the winds pick up on the coast. To fly cross country, we trade a fraction of sink rate for a massive gain in usability. Here are three factors that often improve when you load up your glider. To climb in a thermal, you need to stay in the core. A light wing feels corky. The turbulence may be dampened, but it often gets pushed out of the strongest lift. A well-loaded wing bites into the thermal. It allows you to bank instantly and hold a tight radius. You climb faster, not because you have a better sink rate, but because you are actually coring the lift. Light wings often struggle more in headwinds. Speed is survival when you're pushing into wind, even and especially in laminar coastal conditions if the wind picks up. And the loaded wing provides high definition feedback. It tells you exactly what the air is doing, where the lift is, and how it's changing. You'll have a harder time cultivating real flow if your wing is mumbling to you. 
Wing loading becomes even more important to monitor for small pilots due to a phenomenon called the scale effect. A 50 kilogram pilot is half the weight of a 100 kilogram pilot, but they're not half the size, and the wing is not half the size either. Smaller wings operate at lower Reynolds numbers. This means relatively more drag and less efficiency. Smaller pilots may need to fly near the top of their weight range to achieve an optimal loading, which, relatively speaking, is still light. This explains why small pilots often feel that they're being pushed around. Their wing loading is low, their inertia is low, and that's what they're feeling in the air. This also explains why ozone test pilot Russ Ogden has famously said that he doesn't recommend flying an END under 90 kilograms. At that size, you accept the more violent reactions of a race wing, but because small wings are less efficient, you only get a fraction of the performance gain. So let's jump into the tool quickly so I can show you how it works. All right, so to access this tool, uh, you just go to my website here, fly100.co, uh, and then you can select this item here, wing load, or alternatively, you can just go to fly100.co forward slash wing dash load, and you're gonna be presented here with this page. You just type in your email, I'll use grant at fly100.co to unlock the tool and immediately you're going to get access um, to the tool here. Uh, so the one thing to note is firstly that it's important that you choose which class that you are working in because uh, as we spoke about earlier, uh, the different classes actually have different wing loading. So your lower classes like your ENAs and things, they've got on average a much lower loading than your higher classes. So when you get up to the triple C's, your average loading is in the high fours, whereas in the school ENAs, um, you've got 3.3 to 3.8 kilograms per square meter. Um, when you sign up here to use the tool, you're gonna to get two emails from me. In one of those emails, there'll be a PDF, which basically explains how to use the tool. And also there's a little bit of description as to why I've chosen and how I came about choosing some of the metrics. And it shows you some of the different averages between the classes there. Um, so a couple of things here as well. On the top right hand side here, uh, you can choose how many gliders you can compare. You can, you can choose one or you can compare up to six gliders at a time. Uh, this doesn't work on mobile. On mobile you just have access to one at a time. So if you want to do any comparisons for yourself to choose your different glider sizes. Uh, you can come here. Um, most likely you'll choose one or uh, two or maybe three uh, for your own weight. Um, so let's say we're gonna do that. Let's say we've got three different sizes. What you would do there is you would choose your, let's say ENA glider, or let's say high B. Maybe that's what you wanna choose. Uh, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna select your, your wing size um, across these ones. If you are doing this and you're comparing your own one, then obviously your, your weight, your all-up weight is going to stay the same. So what you can do then is you can choose, let's say that you are flying at uh, uh, 90 kgs all-up. Uh, you can use your arrows as well to incrementally change this. Uh, or you can also double-click here to enter. Let's say it's 90 kgs, enter. Now I can put your lock weight and that's going to lock this weight here. So now I can just uh, manipulate uh, this side. So then what we could do obviously is choose your different wing sizes. Uh, we're using flat uh, wing area here. I've explained why in the document. I know that projected is more aerodynamically correct, but the, the industry standard uh, is flat in aerodynamics and also just helps to standardize it. At a later stage, I may use projected, but that's a whole different thing. For now, I think as long as we have consistency, then we're, then we're good. Um, so then you're here. Now you would change, obviously, your different wing sizes. You'll have to look at your owner's manual to see. And then you can determine uh, basically where you are in your optimal loading. There are cases where you'll be outside of the weight range and you'll still have optimal. There are cases where you'll be within the weight range and you're going to be severely underloaded, especially for small pilots uh, on ENA gliders. That is a function of the aerodynamics. I'm not suggesting that you fly outside of the certified weight range because especially as you go up in classes, you might have some structural issues there. Um, so this tool really is meant as a reference. It's meant to help you decide between a couple of sizes. Um, and here you can go through all of your different uh, categories. So uh, you can also lock your area uh, if, if that way you want to choose one and you want to just manipulate your takeoff weight uh, to optimize, to find exactly where you need to be in your weight range, 
to be optimal. As you can see, their tandems have a much higher uh, average loading. Uh, your triple C's also 4.5 to 4.8. If we go down to low B's, you can see that over 3.9 is heavy. Uh, and that is because uh, school gliders, as we discussed, um, are naturally lighter. So that is the tool. I hope you enjoy using it. Please let me know in the emails if you have any questions or comments. Um, I'm open to improvements. Uh, but for now, I hope that this is useful. Flying light isn't always bad. It's just different. The other day, I flew a tandem loaded light at around 4.34 kilograms per square meter, which is light for a tandem. It was totally safe, and we thermaled high above takeoff without a vario. So there's plenty of feeling and connection there. But I could feel the difference. The wing was softer, the brake pressure was lighter, and the turn authority was definitely reduced. If this had been a small, tight core, I might have struggled to keep in banked enough to stay in it. The takeaway here then isn't that heavy is better. High wing loading has its own dangers. That's why school wings are lightly loaded and why loading generally increases as you move up the classes. It's about choosing the appropriate level of authority for the kind of flying that you want to do. As you move up the classes, you need to take a more active approach, sharpening your skills rather than relying on passive safety. You need to understand exactly how your wing loading affects your feel, handling and penetration into winds. Pilots in the middle aren't flying wrong, there's no one size fits all here, but many may be flying below what their wing is capable of, limiting the clarity of the feedback that builds skill and reducing the authority when conditions get real. But none of this matters if you haven't mastered your active handling. To do this in the air, you need to train your nervous system to recognize and use that high definition signal on the ground. Because on the ground is where great pilots are made. To do that, watch this video next.